Entrepreneurs can get stuck in their head. If you dream of changing the world, but you're not sure where to start, the Ad Valued Entrepreneurs podcast will help you transform your life and business. This podcast is for entrepreneurs who want more freedom and fulfillment from their work so they can live the life that they desire. You deserve it, and it is possible. It's time for you to add value. This episode is brought to you by Perfect Publishing. Perfect Publishing is a different approach to publishing a book. Perfect Publishing is sharing a project of hope. We carefully chose heroes of hope who exemplify living a life they created through faith, hope, patience, and persistence. No matter what page you open to in this mini cube of hope, you will find a leader with a big heart. You see you are not alone. The authors may share similar challenges that only hope and action could resolve. Get your free ebook at getadoseofhope.com. Getadoseofhope.com. Just wanted to mention this episode was recorded earlier. And as our audience grows, we just wanted to share some of the value from our earlier episodes. I'm excited for today's guest, Tony Watley. Tony became known as the Side Hustle Millionaire after his book with the same title became a number one bestseller on Amazon. But the book title isn't just fiction. It's based on his actual story. Tony once led a successful corporate career for over 25 years, but that's less interesting than the side businesses that he created and generated millions in profit. As an active entrepreneur himself, he still owns a few businesses, but his real passion is teaching entrepreneurs how to start, scale, and sell their business within his podcast and consulting brand, 365 Driven. Tony and I have a great conversation and include some time talking about cars. So just looking forward to this talk with Tony. Tony, thank you so much for being willing to jump on the show today. I appreciate the opportunity just to have a conversation. Hey, Robert, I appreciate the opportunity to be on the show and I can't wait to get to know you a little bit better and maybe drop some value here for the audience and have some good takeaways for them. Absolutely. Well, so I hooked you with talking about cars, but we could start with talking about car parts, right? Because I think that's uh, that's where your side hustle kind of started. Um, was that with Mustang parts or was it more than Mustangs? Oh, man, don't offend my GM guys because the, you know the Mustangs were the mortal enemy. I mean, <laughs> they, they just can't. And nowadays, they just can't stay on the road. They always attracted to running over people. And you know, I, I really feel bad for the spectators out there in these kind of racing sports for the Mustangs out there. <laughs> there's some truth to that <laughs> i mean we just i mean it happens over and over again it's like this cliche is being fulfilled i mean we just had an accident here in texas at a racing event on saturday and unfortunately some small kids got killed at the end of the starting line and guess what kind of car it was that went off the track and it's it's just it's almost like they're fulfilling a des destiny with these mustangs yikes yeah that's not good <laughs> no so you were you were building lists and, and creating an audience before social media and before uh, all the conveniences of this current internet world. Yeah, absolutely. I actually am the co-founder of ls1tech.com and performancetrucks.net. LS1 Tech is the largest General Motors performance community on the internet. When we had it, we grew it to about 300,000 registered members and we had over 150 advertising accounts. So it made all its money from advertising revenue. We had big name sponsors, you know, like Chevrolet and Cadillac and Nitto Tire and Michelin and all the big names that you guys know about in the car world. But that's how we did it. We did live events. We did racing around the country and all the hotbeds where we knew that we had a lot of activity. And so we did a really good job of building the community by getting people off of their keyboards. Even though it was an online community, we know, we know that we can make a stronger community if we get them off of their keyboards, come out, shake hands, race some people, do some grudge racing, and then they would leave back as lifelong friends. So we went beyond the screen names. We actually started to know people's first names. Wow. That's that's the ultimate level of networking. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nothing beats in-person events or racing or things like that versus just virtual. virtual. I think after COVID and everybody being quarantined and sitting at home and things like that, I think most of us are really just sick of online events now. We thought it was cool initially. Hey, this is convenient. We don't have to go anywhere. This is great. I can watch it from my house. And now it's like, good Lord, if I got to get on another Zoom virtual summit <laughs> to speak to who knows how many people are watching, it's like it's just not the same anymore. Absolutely. Well, and it, it definitely ruined my Audible account because I spent all my car time listening to Audible and podcasts and, and you get 
you realize, wait, I have three credits, four credits to use. I, I haven't read a book in, in two months. <laughs> uh, now, don't make any excuses for the, the, the commuting for not finishing your books because <laughs> you could do it while you're working out. You could do it while you're walking. You could do it while you're mowing the yard. I mean, there's a lot of times you can do it at the same time. Now you just named four more tasks to put on my list. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So when did you decide to start creating these adventure events? The 365 driven events are a culmination of my wife and I liking to travel and explore the world and just do interesting things. We've been doing that for a very long time. And we used to have some travel companions, you know, fan, you know, couples that would go with us. And, and eventually they had kids and things like that and they just couldn't go anymore. So we were like, you know, my kid's old, he's 21 now. And I said, you know, why don't we just have these events where we just bring our friends with us? You know, why don't we just like make these entrepreneurship events and have them in destination locations, things that she and I want to go see anyways that we want to do like bucket list type things. Right. And we can bring in some speakers that have been guests on my show, bring some people that are out of the group to come hang out and get to know each other again, getting off the keyboards, getting off of the phones and actually coming and giving hugs and shaking hands and meeting some real people. So that's what we did. We just kind of built those things around just where do we want to go? And the first event was in October. We went to Zion National Park in Utah and hiked the Narrows Trail and up a river. And the next event was four months ago. We went to Montana and we hiked to Glacier National Park and we whitewater rafted. And then the next event is going to be November 17th through 19 in Tucson, Arizona at a dude ranch. But we also rented out a racetrack for the day at Radford Racing School driving a Hellcats. So everybody's going to have these 700 horsepower cars driving around with instructors. And we're going to learn autocross and skid pad control and road course and also some dynamic handling. But that's the kind of events we have. Like I figured from us being a speaker and also attending all these events, a lot of them you go to cool destination cities. That's the lure. Like, oh, we're going to go to here, uh, Maui or Miami or Las Vegas, like exciting places to visit. But then you sit your ass on a chair, a hard ass chair for three days in, in a hotel conference room and you never see the light of day. And then you just get back on a plane and you go back to wherever you came from. So you don't even get to explore the cool city that you're in. So we cured that by only having one day of speaking in a three day event, because I know that one day is about as attention that you can hold. <laughs> and the next day we go explore, we go race cars, we go white water rafting, we go hiking, like wherever we're at, we go do that. And then the third day is more socializing at the resort. So you got a full day of relaxing and hanging out and consuming beverages, if that's your thing. And just there's a lot of different things we can do. So we just wanted to make it really a vacation type thing that here's the best thing we can. You can business expense that it's a it's a trip. It's a racetrack day that you can actually expense as a educational thing. That's fantastic. I uh, I'm definitely in tune with, with what you're saying. My wife and I went to an event in January of 2020 in Orlando for the same kind of thing. And they upgraded the rental car like we had this sweet uh, Rover rental car. And we're like, all right. And I put 52 miles on it because <laughs> I was in go. a square box for the entire the entire weekend. Yep. And, uh, and I'm like, I should have just gone with a little Fiat or whatever they were going to give us for $2 a day. <laughs> so just get us there, get us back and then be done with it. Right. Yeah. Yep. It happens a lot. And, and I don't know why people don't think about that. You know, sometimes I think that as a event organizer, we know a lot of speakers or potential speakers, right. Sure. And most of them are your friends and you don't want to leave anybody out. So you're like, Hey, I'm going to do a three day event. I'm going to fill it with three days of speakers because you think more is better. <laughs> but then you realize by the, probably morning of the second day that most people aren't even hanging out inside the conference room anymore. They're just laying, hanging out by the bar, hanging out by the pool, hanging out by the lobby, just talking to other people that are attending because that's the interest, right? It's like you can only handle so many motivational speeches or business speeches. And honestly, if they're not that good of a speaker, they're going to bore you to tears anyways. We call those bathroom break speakers. And so you got to make sure that you have really good speakers, quality control matters. And then you also got to make sure that it's not too long because people just get bored and they just want to go do something else. Well, I think the bonding over, <laughs> over travel experiences and um, working together, teaching together. Um, one of my plans for my company is to uh, host events for entrepreneurs, but going down and training entrepreneurs in developing countries and creating an event experience to combine the travel and teaching, right? So my clients, my power partners 
um, will get to be part of the the table talk teams and the teaching team. And and I definitely want to add an adventure element to it. Um, I took a group of college kids to Uganda. We got to raft the Nile River at the oh, at nice. mouth and and do those kinds of things. Um, I've taken teams to Africa and done safaris. And I know that in those elements, in those environments, the teaching opportunities um, go so much deeper, right? Because you're bonding together over real life experiences. Um, and then in that group environment to have that that extra level of teaching that just, I think it would take it to another level. So I definitely identify with, with what you're putting together and uh, think it's amazing. <laughs> Well, you know, you're one of the only people that I've met that actually has had experience going to Africa. And as much as we see it on National Geographic and the cover of magazines and those infomercials, it's just not the same. And I had the pleasure of working in Angola and Republic of Congo, I spent several months in each of those. And before I went to Africa for the first time, I thought it was going to be just like National Geographic portrayed where everybody's like bone thin. They got flies all over their face. They're crying. They have their hands out because they're begging for food and they're starving. And you're going to feel helpless and you're going to feel like, oh, my God, how do I help all these people? And you got the worst visions in your mind. That's how most people see Africa because they haven't been there. And I remember just getting off the plane and walking through the airport. And it's not a nice airport at all in, in, in Angola. It's just it's not right. Luanda. But I saw people cracking jokes, having a good time, listening to music, dancing around, like having fun, being human. And it's like, okay, well, that's not what I thought it would be. I said, that's good. You know, we get in the vehicle, I got armed guards, we're going to the compound, you know, I had to travel but like an hour by bus, just through all the main streets and through the city. And you see people, you see children running around playing with what they have. You see people living life. You see people telling jokes. You see people just living and being true people. And you start to realize, like, what is all this crap that they show me on TV? It's just not the same. It's this is not who they really are. They're actually really resilient and strong people. They have a lot of pride, even when they don't have money. And also learned in that those trips is that happiness is definitely not associated with money because you and I have both seen people with literally the, the poorest of poor conditions who were still extremely grateful, spiritual, helpful, resilient, strong proud. I mean, they had all these factors that you think that only come with financial success. And we come back here to the States and we see people complaining like first world problems. We joke about that. And it really stings. It's like, man, we live within a bubble, within a bubble, within a bubble. People are complaining that their iPhone isn't working as fast as they thought, or people complaining that the Starbucks coffee wasn't as hot as they wanted it to be. And it's just, oh my gosh, these people have lack of perspectives because they've never gone anywhere like Africa to see what people without actually have. Well, and 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 how content they are with what they do have. I mean, their lives revolve around water and like the Maasai in Tanzania, literally they spend, you know, two hours in the morning getting water and then that water, you know, has to be boiled. So they have to build a fire. And, and everything, the mother, typically the, the mother of the family is responsible for getting the water, getting it back. And and they still very content, but they also still have cell phones, even though they can't charge them anywhere near where they mm -hmm. live. And they know exactly where they can walk to to get signal. They know exactly where they can walk to to uh, charge them. And uh, and and yeah, you know, they're all still smiling. They're all still loving and hugging their children and and mm -hmm. living living their lives because you know, with, with what they have and they don't feel like they're missing out on <laughs> all the things that we, you know, feel like we have to have to, to, to feel good about our lives. Mm. Yeah. That's a good perspective shift. I, I, I probably would never have paid to go there, but I went there for work and I'm glad I got to go. I was blessed to go there for work, but I was able to take mm. teams of missionaries to go there and serve and, and experience. And, yeah. and it definitely, I was blessed to take both my children um, when they were teenagers to uh, two different African trips. My wife was able to go for our 25th anniversary, we went to Kenya together. And mm. and so, yeah, it's uh, pretty incredible, but uh, pretty blessed. I was able to raise my kids in South America for the first 10 years of their lives. So, okay. So. so it wasn't, it wasn't a whole lot different for them, just different people. That's all. Uh, it was a little different. We lived in a you know a city in, in Bogota, Colombia, which mm. is a city of 10 million. And so more okay. like, more like New York than, <laughs> than yeah. like Africa. You know? There you go. 
a little still, faster pace. Absolutely. Yeah. Crowded traffic filled roads and, and, uh, but still people with horse carts or mm -hmm. you know, donkey carts. And, and are certainly the work we did in the communities we worked in were definitely the poor, poorest of the poor there. And so, but definitely the kids experienced, you know, a lot of the, a lot of difference in the world, which is why I want to do that for entrepreneurs. And I want to help not, I want, I want to go down and rent a conference room and, and, and invite the entrepreneurs that can afford to be there. I want to invite the entrepreneur that's got a hot dog cart on the street corner and, mm -hmm. and, you know, offer him the same kind of hope in mindset development and, and belief in, in, in himself and, and just, you know, be able to raise his, his own, just encourage, right. Just spend a couple of days down there, loving on him, encourage him, hanging out with him, to, you know, as a group. And if we can run a racetrack, maybe that's what we'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Because I think that'd be pretty cool. Well, you know, I both know that if there's things that can be raced, men will find out how to race them. A absolutely. Maybe turtles, donkeys, chickens, cars, bicycles, skate, whatever. There's two things that are moving. We will figure out how to race them. Absolutely. <laughs> so your your first side hustle was, was involved with um, forums, right? Online forums mm -hmm. and... Uh, Let's talk a little bit about how you built that up and and what that grew into. I would say my first side hustle was actually building websites. And, you know, people, that's one of the questions I'll get asked is like, hey, Tony, what is the book that changed your life? Like you think that it's going to be some magical book. You may be thinking it's the Bible or it's some <laughs> something that's really spiritual or something that's enlightening. You're going to have these aha moments. And for me, it's like, it's no, it's kind of boring. It's It's kind of nerdy, actually. It's how to code HTML. <laughs> and it's actually still back on that shelf. It's probably a book from like 1996 era, whatever version of HTML at that time was, which is the code to build websites for people that don't know what that is. Two and a half. And, <laughs> yeah, probably, probably something. I can't even remember how bad it is, but it was enough to probably before they even had a decimal, it was probably like HTML one or two, <laughs> and then they started breaking it down. But Anyways, I said, you know what? I, I've always been creative. I like visual arts. I like to paint. I like to draw. I like to do things. And I was always fascinated with graphic design on the internet. And I was like, man, that's like art that is on a screen. Like, how do I build the art that is on the screen? And then, so I started teaching myself how to do Photoshop. I got a bootleg copy from somebody and was playing around with it. And I was making some graphics. I was like, cool. I made fonts. I made 3D stuff. And I said, okay, that almost looks like a website. It just doesn't function. So how do I learn how to make like buttons that click and things like that, you know, and HTML. So I bought a book and I, I went to Barnes and Noble because this is before Amazon was even a thing and read the book and read chapter one and I practice it and I read chapter two and practice it. And I just did that. And soon enough, I got to build these little simple websites, usually one to three pagers is what we'd say now. And I noticed that a lot of car manufacturers like speed shops and performance parts manufacturers and tuning and these things they didn't have websites this was late 90s and so i said oh man if i could just build websites for them maybe they can trade me car parts for my trans am or they could pay me and that's what i did i would i would email them or call them i said hey i noticed that you don't have a website and i build websites i'm in the automotive field that's what i specialize in and i could do a three-page website for a set of headers and they said, well, yeah, we got a lot of headers. We could do a web. We need a website. Yeah, that's a good idea. So I built a lot of websites for car parts, wheels, brakes, rear ends, tuners, like all kinds of stuff. And eventually I had all these parts and I ended up buying like a second vehicle just to put more parts on. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm out of, I don't need any more parts. I need money now. It's like uh, this, this parts thing is kind of getting out of hand. And so I would just pay like, they would pay me like a thousand bucks to build these three page websites. And it would take me six, seven hours to maybe crank one of those out at that time. And so that was my first side hustle. I was still working as an engineer, oil and gas entry level. I, back then I was probably making 45,000 salary. And that was what I did when I got back home from work at, you know, four thirty in the afternoon, I would go to start building websites. And it was a lot better than waiting tables that I did for, you know, 10 years. I, guys, there was a time that I, I had the engineering degree. I had an engineering salary and I'd get home and I was like, I don't, I, I'm not where I want to be. I still don't have enough money. So what do I need to do about that? Well, I grew up thinking that you had to go pick up extra shifts or get overtime or get a second job or a third job. So that's what I did. And I waited tables even with an engineering degree and a job. And, and sometimes the people that worked at that engineering company 
would come in that restaurant and they would see me. Like, hey, Tony, what are you doing here, man? Like, like you're an engineer. Like these were the factory workers and the operations guys. And they would see me like the engineer, like working and waiting tables. And I said, well, it's just, this is what I do in the evenings because I don't have what I want and I'm not where I want to be yet. And they were always enthused, enthused by that. Like, I can't believe like you have an engineering degree and you have a job and you're over here like waiting tables, but that's cool, right? Because I grew up without money and I realized that if I wanted to go get something, I just had to go figure it out. Most people have excuses why they do it and don't do that. And I mean, when I tell that story, some people are like, man, I would never do that if I had a degree and a salary job. It's like, well, that's the difference between you and me. I will, <laughs> you know, I will do what it takes and I won't have too much ego or too much pride to do what it takes. And so I say that because there's a lot of people out there that have degrees and education or, and things like that. And they're just not willing to do what it takes to get the result. They'll sit there and complain about the results or where they're at, but they won't do anything about it. Hmm. And so, yeah, that was me, dude. Side hustle, building websites, trading car parts, waiting tables, working in speed shops, doing whatever I can. I was detailing cars, installing car stereos, like anything I could to make extra money and the time that I had available. Nice. So you mentioned Trans Am. So it was the Trans Am the first, the first car you were building? That was the first LS1 engine vehicle that I had. It was a 98 Formula and six-speed navy blue metallic. And I bought that kind of as a graduation gift to myself when I got out of school. And that was in 98. And I'm glad I bought that car because that's the car that helped me start LS1 Tech, which grew to millions of dollars. So yeah, I started out with a Firebird. I actually had a Mustang GT before that. That's the entry level V8 cool car for everybody that's getting into sports, right? And I was saving up for a Vortex supercharger and I had the, most of the money to go to do that supercharger on the Mustang. And then I was like, you know what? These LS ones come out and they're actually faster than the 96 Mustang GT or the 96 Cobras. Even when you put a supercharger on, I'm like, these things are stock and they're still faster. They're running 12s. They're faster than the Mustangs with a supercharger. It's like, well, why don't I just use this supercharger money to, as a down payment and trade in the Mustang and get one of those cars. And that's what I did. Nice. <laughs> Very good. So when did you decide to uh, build your business around your lifestyle? Honestly, when I built something, I never intended to make a lot of money at it. I just really wanted to build a cool place for my car guys to hang out on the internet and talk about cars and how to make them faster, how to make them look better, how to drive better, how to get the best ETs out of them at the drag strip. And that's what I did is I just built a cool place. And within 10 months, we're probably making about $10,000 a month profit. And I was like, wow, this is not like a hobby anymore. This is actually a legit business. We need to go do something like maybe get an LLC, whatever the hell that is. And maybe we need a separate bank account instead of our personal checking account. Like we started doing all these things, learning about business as we went, because my partner and I, we both had companies that we were working for. We had jobs that were paying, you know, six figures around that time. So I say that also because I think a lot of times people waste too much time trying to prepare themselves, trying to think they needed to know all the answers and, and someday, someday, someday I'm going to start that business. And, you know, I need to go read all these books. I need to listen to all these podcasts. I need to watch all these YouTube videos that there's always preparation. It's always like preparing for something, but they never pull the trigger and actually go do the stuff. Everyone I know that has become highly successful, they didn't know all the answers when they started. They just started. So you actually have to start before you have to have all the answers. Starting is number one. When you start to fall on your face a few times, you waste some money, waste some time, you learn from those things, and then you carry those, those, those lessons with you, and you gain more confidence through action. You don't gain confidence from reading and learning and things like that. You, you gain confidence from action, doing the reps, putting in the work, and then that kind of just fortifies you to keep moving forward as you start taking more and more steps. So now I give a speech when I do these stage things. I have a, it's called ABC of success, a real simple acronym, action, belief, consistency. Hmm. And you notice the first word is action. And the second word is belief. Most people think it's that belief has to come first. Like I have to believe in myself. I have to believe in this business. I have to believe in all these principles. And they're, they think that they've got to have all this knowledge and confidence and certainty baked in, and then they take the action. That's wrong. You got to take the action that builds the belief and then it builds more action. Then it builds more belief. See, and then got to be consistent about it. So ABC is real simple to remember. Yeah. You write out that 
that that 42 step business plan and then you take step one and it blows up step two through 42. Yeah. So, so really you just might as well just take step one and figure out step two afterwards. Absolutely. You got to got to start. Number one regret of all business owners is not starting sooner. Absolutely. So that transition from, you know, working as an engineer, using your engineering degree um, required a mindset shift, right? Like you didn't want to waste your education, didn't want to let your family down. What helped you make that that shift to, hey, I'm doing this on my own. I'm doing, you know, building the lifestyle that I want to have and it's enough. <laughs> Yeah, I was odd because I actually pursued the corporate career and entrepreneurship equally strong for 20 years. <laughs> so I didn't leave corporate until 2015. I sold the company in 2007 for millions and I still kept the job because I was on executive path and I wanted to be a CEO and I was working for Fortune 10 companies and playing with hundreds of millions of dollars and all the coolest hardware. I was an offshore subsea you know, pipeline engineer and project manager. So I was managing projects that are 100 to $500 million, 75 people on a team, international projects. I was working in France and Italy and Africa and England and all these different places. And I was learning a lot of different things about processes and systems and leadership. And these companies, I was working for Chevron at the end of my career. They invested millions of dollars in training in me over 20 years. So I learned a lot from corporate. I think a lot of people underestimate the experience that they learn from their corporate gigs. Maybe they downplay it too much. But guys, think about that. If I'm out there managing and I'm responsible for hundreds of millions of dollars, don't you think small business is really simple to me? It is. You know, when I have a client that comes to me and he's like, oh man, I got this big decision, man. I got to write this PO and it's like $50,000. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself like, Dude, that's like a that's like a drip within a drip within a drip. That's 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 baby money. And I'll give you I'll give you the the shock or the spoiler alert. Decisions are the same whether it's fifty thousand or fifty million. Mm -hmm. You're just assessing the risks. You're assessing the details. You're making the best decision based on the data, experience, lessons that you've learned, and you just make the decision. Now, if you have the financial means to write a fifty thousand dollar check or a fifty million dollar check. That's the difference, but the decision-making skill is really the same. Because I remember even being that junior engineer and writing my first purchase order for a million dollars, and I was thinking, "Oh my gosh, I'm I'm actually filling out this piece of paper that has my name on it, and I'm signing it, and it's got a million dollars. Like we're buying something for a million dollars. Like that was like so like out of the norm like feeling for a minute, and that really shows the scarcity mindset that we have around money. Because oh my god, this is so much money, and you get all stressed out about it. I can't make this decision, but you have all the information in front of you. And later in my career, I'm, I'm signing things for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars in chunks. We had a day, a day rate that was burning $1.7 million per day offshore. So it, it's the corporate side prepared me very well for what I do now, but most people don't give that kind of credit. And I get that I had a really crazy job and, and was doing things at a really high level, but I was really dedicated to doing that. And so the reason I started the automotive stuff is because I love cars. Oil and gas is something that I was good at and I was well compensated at, but it doesn't mean I gotta love it. You know, there's a lot of people out there that may watch this or listen to this that kind of relate the same way. It's like, hey, just because you're good at your job and you're well compensated for your job, doesn't mean you love it. Doesn't mean that was what you were meant to do. It just means that's, that's how you pay your bills. And so my passion was always cars. And also in my late twenties, I graduated after working construction and being a welder and a pipe fitter for eight years, it took me to finish my degree. And so when I graduated, I already had a lot of field experience because I'd been the guy out there doing the stuff. And they wanted to treat me like a brand new engineer that had never had any experience. And I was like, guys, I, I was out there doing this stuff that you're, you're trying to have me like be a beginner at now, right? So I understood how designers like screw things up, for, make it really hard for welders and pipe fitters like had to design the pipe racks that can get to the welds and lay out the pipe properly. And like, like all the problems that the operations guys complain about that the engineers always mess up. I, I knew how to fix all those things. Right. And so I got tired of being told that I had to wait my turn to, to get promoted and that, you know, you got to pay your dues and then, hey, if you want Bob's seat, you got to stick around another five years, you know, and he gets promoted, you'll get that chair. And I'm thinking like Bob is like a year older than me. 
I've got eight years of experience. He just started out of school a year ago. Like who's actually more valuable here, right? So I started looking for external ways to test my creativity, my judgment, my decision-making, my leadership, because I wasn't getting it at my corporate job. So I had to go look for external ways to do that. So that was one of the other reasons I started the business. Nice. We will be right back after this short break. This episode is sponsored by the newly released book, Dream Life Planner, Move from Tired and Overwhelmed to Free and Empowered by Noel L. Peterson, available on Amazon, or you can order a personalized signed copy at empower, E-M-P-O-W-E-R, to dream.com. That's empower, number two, dream.com. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends. Welcome back. Let's get back to more greatness. Being able to let go of that corporate job, I mean, obviously you waited quite a long time. What what held you back? 2015, we were having an oil industry downturn. I was wrapping up one of those Africa projects and we hit first oil and we had about six months left on the project. And then we all knew that we were going to get laid off because there wasn't any more projects in the pipeline. They basically were going kind of go cold on us. And we started to downsize the team and I was always in the, in the leadership side. So I was looking at who we're going to have to lay off and making those hard decisions. And I started seeing some of the companies doing really unethical things with people that had been there 20, 30 years and paid their dues and were real close to pensions and retirements. And these companies would really just kneecap them and chop them like right near the finish line. So they would only get 80% of the retirement instead of hundred percent of the retirement, you know? So I started seeing that these decisions were made purely on a financial reason, not based on performance or how long that person's been there or giving them some grace. I had the opportunity to lay a woman off that was two months away from her full retirement. And she'd been there 20 years. Had she just, we had six months left to work. I still needed her, but they kept somebody that wasn't even close to a pension that was around the same salary. So it wasn't even a financial reason on that. They really just did that to avoid having to pay her her pension that she donated her entire career to. And so that didn't sit well with me. That was just one example. There's many examples of that. And we see that in a lot of these industries. And I said, I don't know if I want to come back to this industry that treats people like this. They, they all say the right things when the industry is good and they're making money that they care. But whenever there's adversity or downturns, and I've been through three of those in my career, it's always the same. It's like, it's a financial reason. It's not personal. It's like, yeah, but now I'm in that age group and that salary group that I'm one of the first ones to get cut because I'm expensive and they can hire someone that's 10 years younger than me that paid, that paid them a lot less and they can keep the seat warm until I return. Right? So ageism is a thing. It's illegal and it's not in any process. You'll never see it written down, but those conversations do occur. And I didn't like being a part of those conversations because they also, when you're sitting in a room with other people and you're having those conversations, even though that you're not supposed to, your name gets attached to those kind of things. And I said, I don't like this. This is not what I want to do. And I only realized that as I'm approaching more executive roles, it's only going to get worse. Hmm. And so my core values and my ethics are a lot stronger. So that was one reason. So I was already one foot out the door. And I knew that was going to get laid off at the end of the year anyways, because the project was going to get wrapped up. But then here's the thing, racing cars, going back to that. I was in a near-death experience racing cars at the drag strip. I was uh, driving a shop-owned car, prototype, twin turbo Dodge Viper that they were trying to be the first ones in the nines with the Gen 5 Viper. Thousand horsepower at the wheels. I've got a couple of those myself. My other Viper is 1,200 at the wheel, so i got a lot of seat time. It runs low nines, and they couldn't get their driver, couldn't get it to go. To, he couldn't launch it right, and they're like, hey, dude, could you ride this for us? Because we know that you can do this. Like, We just want to get the first one. I was like, cool. And so they put a new set of tires on it, new set of wheels on the back, brand new, fresh set of slicks, made a few changes, turned the boost up a little bit, and... It launched good. I think I cut like a one, one, five, 60 foot. It was a really good 60 foot. And I knew that it was on a number. I was like, cool, this, this is going to be easy nine. Like this is, this is probably a nine sixty nine seventy run. Well, top of third gear, the, I was in the right lane. Luckily I was by myself on the track. It was the last pass of the night. And the car started pulling to the right and I was in that right lane. 
And it started approaching the concrete wall. And I was like, man, like what the hell's with this car? Like it just wants to go right. And I, this is the first time I haven't drove the car, right? And I was like, well, maybe the alignment's off or just something's weird about it. And it didn't happen until like past eighth mile. And so I start trying to just steer it a little bit left, but it's still going to, it's deciding, still wants to go right. And now it goes, starts sliding against the wall on that, on that side. And, and I was angry with myself. I was disappointed in myself because I damaged somebody else's car that was very expensive that they trusted with, you know, and I thought the worst was over. And so I, I basically said, okay, well, I'll just slow down and come off this wall and, you know, I'll damage the side of the car, you know, and what happens when I come off the wall, the right rear wheel kicked out because what had happened is something in that rear suspension had broken its independent rear axle. So it steers when that happens. And so the rear wheel was doing the steering for me. And then the car went really hard left and I'm still doing 130 right there, top of third. And now I'm looking at the Jersey barriers on the other lane and I'm heading straight at them and I'm steering straight. The car's going hard left. It was, there's nothing I can do. And in that moment I said, well, here I go. And you would think that you'd be fearful or be screaming or, you know, feeling something like that. And for me, it was peacefulness. I was just, I felt warm and I felt peaceful. It was truly a Jesus take the wheel type moment. And it felt like an eternity. And I know that the speeds I was traveling, it really wasn't as milliseconds, but it felt like a really long time before I hit that wall. But I just felt comfortable. And I realized that, hey, if this is my time, it's my time. I didn't, I didn't feel any fear. I didn't see my lat life flash before my nothing cheesy like that. I just felt really calm, you know, and I remember right before hitting the wall, just shutting my eyes and the airbags deployed and the cabin filled with the, the powdery smoke from the airbags. And I could hear the car just being ripped to pieces and glass breaking and carbon fiber and aluminum being just, just twisted and bent and cracking and just engine making this terrible noise. I guess the suspension had freed up and the engine RPM, maybe my foot was on the gas. I don't know. I just, it was really loud. Then I just remember just being awake in that moment, realizing I had survived the impact, but I didn't, I didn't know if I was injured or not. I just remember I need to stay awake and get out of this car. I just need to stay awake. I just focused on keeping consciousness because you and I both know most people pass away from the fire, not the impact. You know, so car finally came to a rest. I had to pry that door open and get out and, you know, the car was destroyed. Every single panel in that car was bashed in. There's wheels off of the car. All the fluids are strewn out. I mean, one spark would have lit that thing up like a bonfire. And I got out of the car and I, and I just stood there and I took the helmet off and I'm looking at the car wreckage and I could hear the ambulance on the other end of the track approaching. I could hear my friends sprinting up the track and I could hear four wheelers approaching. And, you know, they put me in the back of the ambulance and I'm still looking at the wreckage. It's right there. And the paramedics inspecting me and checking all my vitals and asking me questions to see if I have a concussion and, and I'm answering all the questions really clearly. And at the end she said, Hey, do you mind if I tell you something unusual? And I'm like, Oh crap, here it goes. Like here, she's going to tell me what I'm injured or something, right. That I don't know about. And she just said that you're remarkably calm. She said that everybody crashes out here all the time. Like they have the adrenaline shakes or elevated heart rate, the cold sweats, the physiological signs of trauma. Like, like you're just remarkably calm. Your heart rate's resting. And, and I said, I am calm. And it was just that same feeling that I'd gone from like looking at a wall saying, well, here I go thinking I was going to die. And then I'm sitting in the back of the ambulance, still the same calm. Right. And it took me maybe a month to look back and realize like, why was I think, what was I thinking? Cause I, I think somebody asked me that, what were you thinking when you're in the back of that ambulance? And it was real simple. It was real clear. It was, I'm looking at the car thinking like, why am I still here? And what if I would have died? And then I started thinking if I would have died tonight, how would I have been remembered? Hmm. And then that one you sit with for a little bit, how would I have been remembered? If anybody's listening to this, if this was your last day, because it could be, you just never know. How would you be remembered? How would your spouse remember you? How would your kids remember you? How would your friends remember you? Everybody's got a different perspective. Like put yourself in their perspectives. Like if you could write the eulogy as read by each of them and understand like, how would you be remembered? And you're really honest with yourself. You're probably going to come up with something that's not, not as a, not near your potential. 
I started thinking about the friends that I'd lost and the answer was rich guy, cool cars, nice, gone too soon. I mean, it's the cliche stuff, right? Very superficial. I said, is that good enough for me? I want to be remembered as nice, rich guy with cool cars. It's like, no, that's, that's not cool. I mean, yeah, there's definitely been people I impacted in my life. I've helped 12 of my former employees become millionaires by helping them build their own companies. My family has been taken care of. Parents still love me. I mean, all, there's a lot of good things, but it's always what it told me is I, unless you're really close proximity to me, you didn't get the benefit of my love, my attention, my knowledge, my experience, because I led a really private life. And I didn't like to put myself out there. I didn't like to be on camera. I didn't like to be on, I didn't like recorded voice. I had stage fright. I had all these insecurities around putting myself out there. I was really successful at building brands and hiding behind the logo. I was okay being the MVP in the background, right? After that, I started realizing like I need to make more impact. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't like, that's a real deep question. Like, how do you make impact? It's like, it's like, what's the meaning of life? Like, what's your purpose? Like, these are really deep questions. And if you would have asked me those same questions at every decade of my life, I probably would have give you a different answer because we evolve, we gain more awareness, we get more experience. We start to realize what really matters. And, and that's decided, okay, I'm, I'm not going to go back to oil and gas. And people thought I was crazy. Like, how can you leave like a multiple six figure salary and 20 years of experience and waste your engineering degree and all this stuff, right? You know, it's like, yeah, 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 I get that, but I'm not making enough impact. And so that's when I decided to write the book. Two years later, I started thinking about what do I want to do. I, well, the best way I'm going to impact people is by teaching them business principles and confidence. And that's the things I, I always love is cars and business. I was a kid that would read Entrepreneur and Forbes and Success as much as I would read my Hot Rod magazines because I was broke. And I figured if I read stuff that talked about money, maybe I'd learn what they're talking about and maybe someday I would have money, right? <laughs> and so it was a, I didn't read it because I was fascinated with it. It's like, I'm going to unlock this puzzle. It's a game to me, right? Seems to have worked. But I said, okay, I can talk about business and entrepreneurship and these things all day long at a high level of energy. So maybe that's how I'm going to impact the world. And that's what it's become. So I said, I'm going to write this book, Side Hustle Millionaire. I'm going to teach people how to take their ideas and make them their first business. And that was the basis of the book, dude. And even then, dude, I, <laughs> I wrote the book because I thought that it could be a way of creating impact without being on the stage again, <laughs> without being on a camera, without being a speaker. And as I'm writing it, the editor is looking at the book. He's like, man, this is going to be really good. I think people are going to want to interview you. You're probably going to be on, you might get on TV. I was like, shit, like the thing I'm trying to avoid, <laughs> the thing I'm trying to avoid, Robert, by writing a book, because you could be a successful unknown author, right? It's confronting me again. So I actually had to go prepare myself. I said, okay, I need to go make changes to myself. Like it's not enough just to write a book. It's, I need to go become the right person to carry that book and champion that book and share the story and the message of that book. And so I hired a speaking coach and I joined Toastmasters and I made videos every single day on social media to practice what I was learning. And I did that for over a year. And now I've been on TV. I actually just signed a deal to be on a TV show Woo. and a radio and 350 podcast interviews and my own show, 200 episodes in it. So I want to I want to illustrate this to you and the listeners is that the thing that you're hiding from, the thing that's uncomfortable, go try it. You may actually unlock something that you have a skill at. You may unlock something that you actually love doing when you start to see the the better version of you that you've been avoiding. And that's for me is speaking on stages with thousands of people now. I love to do that. And I used to be terrified of that but I had to go become the right person. And that's the work. That's the thing that most people will avoid. Most people just want to write the book and hide from the rest. Well, you mentioned character a few times, right? I mean, obviously the character decisions in, in not agreeing with the corporate choices they were making in regards to people. And then of course, developing your own character to be the man that you needed to be to have the impact that you wanted to have. Um, so what would you say to somebody about developing their character you can do the easy thing or the right thing, but rarely is the right thing the easy thing. 
Sometimes it is. Sometimes you luck out and the right thing is the easy thing, but it's it's usually the thing that you avoid or the thing that takes a little bit more effort or thing that takes a little bit more quality or a little bit more care or passion or precision. Like there's a, there's a lot of things and you know, you can do, you can do the easy way or the right way, you know, and, and you find that most people that are always looking for the easy way, they're not going to get the result. The people that do things continuously the right way are almost guaranteed to get the results. So I'm not saying that you got to be perfect, but let's say that 95% of the decisions you make are the right decisions Whew, and you're doing it and you're doing it for the right reasons and you're not cutting the shortcuts and you're not half-assing your effort, you're going to have a lot closer taste of that potential and probably get it, get a hold of it by doing that. But if you just continually make bad decisions, even simple decisions, like I think people think that when I'm talking about decisions, they think it's like, do I start this company and name it this? Like you think it's always these big, big decisions, <laughs> but guys like, your life is filled with decisions on a daily basis. The food on the end of your fork is a decision. You going to the gym that day is a decision. You following up on your sales calls, knowing that conversion rates 40% by following up and you don't do it, that's a decision. Hmm. Sitting on the couch to watch TV, that's a decision. Like all these things are decisions. We, we have a, a full day of them. So what I think about is who do you want to be in three years? Who do you want to be in five years? Who do you want to be in 10 years? Visualize yourself. If you're, if you're watching this, listening to this, visualize the best version of you in three years. What do you look like? What's your level of fitness? What do your relationships look like? How do you walk? How do you talk? How do you dress? What's the number of money in your bank account? How many businesses have you started or how many people are on your team? Like, I want you to really visualize, like if I could just draw out the perfect version of me, like that, that's what I visualize. It may not even be anything like you right now, but it's, it's what you want. That's the, that's what's important, right? Maybe your speaking is not as good, or maybe you're out of shape, or maybe you don't dress the way you want, but you can visualize the way you do want. All of us can. And then every single decision you make, no matter how small, just ask yourself a real simple question. What would the future version of Robert do today? What would the future version of Tony say in this, this A or B scenario? And if you start operating like the future version of yourself, soon enough, you will become that person. It's, it's, it's impossible to not become that person. If you start operating and thinking like that future version of yourself would to get the results that they have, you will get there. It takes time. So here's the beauty of that also understanding. If you're in a situation in life right now that you're not happy with, realize that it's because of the decisions you made years ago that led you here. If you take full accountability, you did all those decisions to get to where you are today. But that should also empower you to understand that I can make changes today that create what I'm gonna to be tomorrow. Yep, so good. So what you're saying is we can't be a victim of our circumstances. we got to be responsible. Absolutely. Full accountability. Do what it takes to bring about what you want. I mean, every, every success or achievement that you want in your life has been done with somebody with more hardships and more potential excuses that they didn't use. <laughs> nice. All right, I'm going to switch things up. You mentioned Lisa a couple of times. So mm -hmm. what's uh, your most memorable date? Oh man, I, would, I actually say with my wife that I danced with my wife almost weekly for a year before we even started dating. All right. What kind so, of dancing? So we actually met in a country Western ballroom dancing class. Nice. I took it with a buddy of mine because we knew that, hey, we go to the country bars here in Houston. And I knew that the guys that could dance had uh, a literally a line of women tapping them on the shoulder like hey let's go dance and so it didn't take too much of a genius to realize like hey dude if i can go learn a few moves out on the dance floor like i will have all the women wanting to dance with me nice. guys pay attention to that because it works in almost every type of dancing salsa country if you know how to dance you're going to get women dancing with you if you're single take notes and so <laughs> she was she was taking a class with her sister and her best friend at the time 
you know, they just like to dance. They want to learn some moves too. And that's where we met, but then we'd see them at the clubs and we'd all dance together and things like that. So she had a boyfriend at the time and I was dating multiple women at the time. And I was like, no big deal, like whatever. Right. But soon enough, like she was single and yeah, we went on a couple of dates and yeah, we've been together 20 years now. So it, it's, I met her at the dance studio and we danced for almost a year before we even started dating. So it's kind of a, a unique story. Nice. Mm -hmm. So where, where's the, the biggest place that you guys want to go? What's the dream trip? I think we've done those things. I mean, we've been all over Europe. My wife likes wineries and wine and vineyards and things like that. So we've basically gone all the European countries that have them and we haven't done the Asia pack. So all the Asia stuff, you know, I was actually born in Japan. I'm half Japanese, but we haven't done any Asia trips. So I think that'll be the next thing. If you know, the world travel starts to open up again. So if not, you know, we did, we did seen a lot already. Yeah. It's nice to be able to have seen a lot. And I hear everybody talking about these virtual reality trips and, you know, <laughs> it, it brings to mind total recall for me. And it's like uh, experiencing it firsthand is my, pre my preference yeah. Um, yeah. for sure. So <clears throat> obviously you've done a lot of networking. You've built a lot of relationships. Relationship is one of your four cores. Mm -hmm. Um, what would you say to an entrepreneur just in, in terms of building relationship? I think that a lot of times people self isolate themselves and they don't get into the concerted effort to go network and actually meet people. And I actually made a post on this on one of my social media channels last week about how most of us like to have this really egotistical thing of saying we're self-made and we do everything ourselves. And when you start to really look back at your actual opportunities in life, the things that you've achieved, they were always directly a result of somebody you knew or somebody that was in your network, right? That's where the spark occurred. That's where the opportunity first presented itself. Maybe the friend that hired you or someone that referred you to a job or someone that sent you a lead or just something that somebody knew somebody, somebody knew you, you knew somebody, and that created the opportunity. And so, when you really think about that, it's like, wow, so more opportunities could be a result of just meeting more people or treating people right and doing the right things by people and not being expecting anything in return. That's the beauty, right? If you go out there and help people on a daily basis without expecting something in return, the universe will work in your favor to make that happen for you. It'll happen longer down the road. It'll happen indirectly. But these networks of people that you create and you meet, somebody's going to do a referral. Somebody's going to make a, a pull a pull a string to get something to happen for you if you're treating them well. Somebody knows somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that can make your dream come true. Literally, literally, the dreams that you have, everybody that has a dream, it's really just one person's decision away from happening. Hmm. But you have to go out there and find that person, present them value and treat people correctly and those things happen to you and so i think that a lot of times people just get home from work and they just sit on the couch i think that they're not getting on social media and actually engaging with people that are interesting to them maybe that could be potential gatekeepers for the success of the opportunities that they want to have they're not joining these groups or, and when they do to join the groups are half ass them they're not even showing up in them they're not participating in them they're not really contributing any value to them and the way that I built my success is really just contributing value to groups in a public manner where I start to build a name for myself as somebody that contributes, somebody that always answers your questions, somebody that shows up, somebody that supports you, somebody that will throw a like when they see you're doing something on a social media that they are proud of you trying or they see you're doing something that's helping the world or helping yourself or just something that's positive. You'll find that a lot of people scroll past that stuff and not even give it to them because they got that that scarcity mindset within themselves. Oh, look at this guy like working out like, oh, uh, look at this person like feeding starving children. Like, what does he think he is? Like, he's like cool or something like there's like all these weird like scarcity mindset things that are going on up there in the general public, especially nowadays, that I will be that person that will like your post. I will let you know that my presence is there and that I acknowledge you for doing the good things that. I think that's showing good character, good judgment. And so I will like those things and I will respond to things and I will support people. And I've been doing this for since I've been on the internet, since 1995 when I got on the internet. So 
if you want to learn the keys of success, it's really just about showing up and supporting other people, treating people kindly, not being a, not being a pushover. If you guys follow my social media, you realize I'm not a pushover. I'm very vocal with the things I believe. And it's, I'm okay being provocative and I'm okay <laughs> rocking the boat, but you can do it in a respectful manner. You can go back to how Socrates would just, just debate people and ask them the right questions to set them up to realize that they don't know as much as they think they do. And they can hang themselves based on the things that they say. So just go out there and help people, guys. And if you're feeling in a, in a bad place anytime, if you're feeling depressed, if you're just feeling like you're in an off day, just go out there and answer people's questions. Go acknowledge people. Go send private messages to people to help other people, encourage other people. And you know what? There's going to be an endorphin release and you will have a physical state change that you can't even avoid. You're going to feel like a, you're going to just feel better from doing that. I know Robert sounds like you're that kind of person as well. So, but you got to go make that effort. That's the action before the belief again, right? ABC. Absolutely. You got to take the action, even if you don't believe it. And then well, when you do the action, you start to believe it. Well, and then it's that consistency, right? Like, one workout doesn't a uh, fitness guru make, right? <laughs> you know, and and we have these expectations, these microwave expectations, right? Like I'm going to throw it in there, hit the 30 second button and everything will be done and ready to go. And, you know, our, our mindset development, our physical fitness development and, and our business development just needs that consistency. It needs yeah. daily. You, you just got to do that. You got to do this, do the work every day you just gotta do yep. the work and and i like that you just you know if you go out and help 10 people every day good stuff's gonna happen <laughs> it world. always does dude it, it yeah. always does i mean there will be people that reach out to me that i haven't heard from in 15 years and they're like hey uh i know somebody that's looking for this thing that you do and you know uh, you know would you like to meet them like it, it's like the good deeds you did a decade ago are still coming back. Like you got to build the pipeline of those and start today. If that's not been you start today, be really conscious of it and don't get discouraged because like Robert said, like we always think that you're going to get an instant return on our actions. It's not true. Like these things take years, years. Well, and, and the, the, the return is that endorphin, right? Enjoy the endorphin, appreciate yeah. it. You know, keep a file of the of the good comments. Keep a file of the praises because you'll need them. <laughs> There's <laughs> days that, that the crap hits the fan, and you're going to need those those praises. And you go look at them and say, "Oh, Robert did this. Ha, oh, I feel better now." Right? Like, <laughs> you know, we had that great conversation. Or keep keep track of that stuff because there are days when you you need that pick me up, and you got to pick yourself up because it it's, if you're running your own business, there's no one there to pick you up. No, I think about motivation as optional, discipline as mandatory. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's terrific. So what inspires you, Tony? What's your inspiration? My real inspiration right now the, is the gratitude I feel from seeing other people transform and get out of their own way and just do the things that they dream about. And if I can instill the confidence in them to take the actions and start to believe in themselves, even when they don't believe in themselves, I can see the potential. I, I've been gifted and I think there's a lot of people that are empaths that can look at other people and see the potential within them that they don't even see for themselves. I've been able to do that since I was a kid. Like I would look at my friends and it's like, why can't you do this skateboard trick? I, I, you're physically fit. You can do this. Like, let's just come on, let's do this. Like, you know, I just teach them how to do it and make them believe it's possible and encourage them. And, you know, soon enough, they're doing the trick and they're, they're shocked that they could do it. So, I always thought that that was a normal thing that everybody saw in other people. And, and to be honest, I, I see very few people in my life have approached me and saw potential in me. Mm -hmm. So I had to see it in myself, my parents and my mom and my dad. Yeah, we can, they could see it. Right. But rarely would you have somebody that just like, you know what, I've been watching you and you know, you have this potential that, you know, I just wanted to give you an outsider's perspective. Like you don't really hear that very often, you know? And so, I do that with the people all the time, especially people that are in my group or people that are my, my clients. And you can tell that they don't believe it at first. And then within six months, seven months, a year, like they're full on believing what they, what they heard a year ago because they've gotten the results that they thought they would never have. So 
yeah, just for me, it's like watching people change, watching people improve. That's what I love. So good. So good. Well, I definitely appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate, you know, you sharing just so many great stories. Um, I know Lisa and you just drove some really cool cars. So did that change your next car purchase? Does, are you getting Lisa one of these, one of these sports cars? Yeah, I mean, we, we do love our American cars. We got a couple of Vipers and, and classic cars and muscle cars and things like that. But I think that, I think maybe a 911 GT3 RS would be a fun car to have after driving that. Yeah, I can see the allure. It's a, it's definitely a little track car for sure. Yeah, I mean, if I didn't have, already have the Viper, I would probably say I'd rather have a Viper ACR, but I've already got a Gen 5 Viper. That's, you know, nine-tenths of an ACR. So, you know, so... It's like the same experience with a different wing on the back. <laughs> nice. So what's what's your big dream? Man, I think that my big dream after doing what I do is just to leave a, an impact, just to leave some kind of legacy that goes deeper than just the person I'm teaching. Because I truly understand and I believe that if I change somebody's life now, it's not going to just affect them. It's going to affect their entire family. Mm -hmm. So it's a generational legacy that we're building. And you're the same way. If, you help someone in Uganda get an education and become inspired and do something. You're not changing that person's life. You're changing their entire generational legacy for hundreds of years, potentially. Hmm. So we carry a lot of responsibility on our shoulders, but somebody has got to do it. Yeah, well, somebody's going to do it. Might as well be me. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Man. Thank you so much for such a great conversation. Last chance. Young entrepreneur, words of wisdom. Uh, to me, just get it started. You know, quit saying someday, because if you look on a calendar, there's no someday. It's just Monday through Sunday. There's no someday. So quit saying that. Quit saying I'm going to try, because even Yoda hates that word. You know, <laughs> right. there's, there's no try. Like, remove these stupid words from your vocabulary and start hanging around with people that push you and see your potential rather than people that try to hold you back or say things like, remember where you came from and you know, that kind of shit. So just surround yourself with the right people that are doing the things that you want to do and just get started. Learn as you go. Yeah. Love that. So much can happen when you take a step and learn from the experience and apply it. I mean, even as basic as the HTML book, read mm -hmm. chapter one, apply it, read chapter two, apply it. So good. And don't, don't skip even, chapters. Don't skip chapters. You know? <laughs> <laughs> don't jump ahead. Yeah. Tony, thank you so much. Hey, Robert, appreciate it. It's enjoyable. Thank you for the opportunity, brother. If you enjoyed the show, please like, subscribe, or leave a review. We have a free gift for you at addvaluemindset.com. That's addvaluemindset.com. We've collected some of the best mindset secrets shared by successful entrepreneurs on our podcast and we want to give them to you for free. addvaluemindset.com In our next episode, Mary Catherine Johnson and Robert talk about her journey, starting with t-shirts celebrating pregnancy. When her first business floundered, she went through an identity crisis before starting over and learned more about marketing and online funnels, which led her to create automation tools for the marketing process. Today, she empowers and teaches others how to build their business through her courses and podcasts.